There will be spoilers ahead. Lots of spoilers, so be careful, won't you? Welcome to Max Mike Movies, the show that lasts about an hour. This is the first episode in a brand new little series, the first of its kind. We didn't pick the films for it. They weren't even picked by someone we know. Uh, oh, right, I forgot. The person in question is a close personal friend of Max who yep. has never met him. Patton Oswald, comedian. Yes, we do. We live in a gold house on the moon. Yes, and fight Nazis. No, Pat yep, Oswald, yep. comedian, Marvel star, actor, magician, and singer of renown, walked into magician. a closet and pulled out a list of films that are all totally movies we haven't seen before or heard mm -hmm. of. But yeah. hey, that's how we grow, right? That and by eating a bowl of Bumpy Puck cereal. Oh, Lord. <laughs> it comes out the same way as it goes in. <laughs> that's, yep, it comes out the same color. Yep. Yeah. Because Patton said so as the series, and first up is a gritty little bit of celluloid, Detour, from 1945. Who's its star? Pfft, no one I know, but mm. that might be a point in its favor, or it might not. On my right, trust me, it's my right, is that High Plains drifter of film commentary, Max Big Irving Levine. Shoot us off some noir talk, Max. Yeah, it was a raining out. Why go out? Take a <laughs> coat. Make sure you got an umbrella. <laughs> There's a reason there isn't a lot of Jewish noir. <laughs> <laughs> but there should be. <laughs> there should. <laughs> and me, I'm the other guy, Mike Two Bit Loose. Trust me, two bits is all I have. And if you're a regular listener, you'll agree. And it's all you're worth. Yeah, sure. In case you're wondering or poised to write us a nasty little email about not getting permission to use Patton's list, I can inform you that we totally did. Yes, we did. I did. I wrote to Patton, and he said, Sure, Max, you're my best friend, so you can use my list, and then we're going to go to the Grammys and hang out with Taylor Swift. Yeah, we got it actually right from his publicist, or, or his dog groomer. I think groomer. it was so, I, somebody in the management, a couple of admittedly very nice people, very helpful people in yes. the management team, pa allegedly passed it on to Patton. Sure. Yeah, we and, can't remember yeah. who it was, but uh, it, this is actually all legal and stuff, and heck, yep. maybe... Just maybe, Patton will even drop by. Hard to do on a pre-recorded show, uh, yeah. but when you're not live, <laughs> anything can happen. It's my head cannon. You should respect it. Yeah, again, shoot that thing off. And what yeah. happens now is we hear hmm. your answers to our poll question. Last week, we asked what film you thought should have won an Oscar for Best Picture, but didn't. Oh, yeah, I can't imagine why we asked that. Oh, mm. my. Did you have opinions? <laughs> you had thoughts. Oh, boy. From the website, our KG Canadian Vince, a man who holds no fear of penguins, wrote, quote, I don't watch or pay attention to the Oscars, but they did give one to Star Crash, The Adventures of Stella Star. So no, maybe they, they all didn't. So all bad, end quote. <laughs> um, Vince, I'm not going to look this up, but I can assure I you, did. no Oscar was given to Stella Star. None, None ever. zero, zilch. <laughs> but thank you. Mm. Keith Wright was next with two great choices, quote, Malcolm X and Black Klansmen, end quote. Thanks, Ooh, Keith. Oh, good, yeah. Yeah. Dave! Dave! Little novel comes next. Quote, I view the Oscars as a reflection on Hollywood politics and not on the quality of the actual films. That's they, fair. They provide an interesting mirror on society, but winning an Oscar is not a guarantee of quality or that the film will be entertaining or even that it will have any valid intellectual or artistic substance. In that context, I can't genuinely identify any movie that, in my view, should have won but didn't. But to play along, I will nominate Repo Man, as it is a near-perfect expression huh. of a small portion of society at a particular moment in time. It is mm. eminently quotable, and what's not to love about Harry Dean Stanton? His True. eyebrows. Other close candidates... Don't would diss the eyebrows. <laughs> Those are like past Gandalf lever, but... Um, hey, hey, some of us are gifted in that area, okay? Yeah, gifted, that's what we call you, gifted. Other mm. close candidates would include Wild at Heart and The Man with Two Brains. Wait, <laughs> wait, 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 wait a, a minute. minute. <laughs> 
Thank you, Dave. Yes, that's a long-running joke between me and Dave. In the Japan context, the first Domestic Mm. Film Academy Award, i.e. awarded by the Japanese filmmaking community to its own filmmakers, Mm. best picture was, I believe, The Ball at Anjo House. And it nicely captures the mood and plight of the aristocracy during the occupation as MacArthur rolled out his land reform and dismantled the pre-war social power structure. A great movie to have seen. And I suppose about as entertaining as On the Waterfront, end quote. I wonder if that means if he liked it or didn't. (laughs) Did they never know? know. (laughs) On the Waterfront's a really good movie. I don't know if I'd call it entertaining. Mm. But either way, thanks, Dave. Yeah, those are cool. Charles Forsyth... Okay, someone's just trying to get my attention. He wrote, quote, Since Ilsa, She-Wolf of the SS, wasn't even nominated, I'd have to go with the first film of Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy. It was a real triumph of filmmaking, and everyone knew it. I think the Academy Mm. waited for the third movie so they could, in a way, give the Oscar to the trilogy. I think they're Mm. doing that with Dune. I just don't know if they're waiting for part two or if they'll wait for the third movie, second book. End quote. Well, Mm. Dune was only a part one, right? So maybe that's fair? Mm. eh, Thanks, Charles. Yeah. Regan McStravick was up next with, quote, I stopped having any faith in the Oscars of the year. Terms of Endearment won over The Dresser, 1983, I think, maybe 84. Ah, uh, yeah. Who, there was a, a, some big actor played that main part. Who was that? Do you remember? But in, in, in The Dresser? Yeah. That was Albert Finney. Oh, okay, that's what I thought. I knew it was somebody mm. big. Since then, I have only agreed with the Oscars a couple of times. I mean... Ever After, which has some of the most beautiful scenes I have ever seen in a film, wasn't even nominated for Art Direction. And Howard's Uh, End winning for Art Direction when Toys was perhaps the most brilliantly art-directed film ever made? Pretty much the only time I... eh? Pretty much the only time I care about the Oscars is when I hope that some small film that nobody's heard of might suddenly find an audience because it wins or is nominated for something. But that Mm. usually doesn't happen because the Academy tends to lean strongly towards films that are already commercially successful, end quote. Well, it's not always the big budget movies. Um, Coda? Moonlight? Mm. (laughs) But you do have some good points. Thanks, Regan. Mm. George Saulnier replied with, quote, I was flabbergasted at Out of Africa taking so many awards from Brazil, end quote. Oh, Oh, they are not going to give anything to Terry Gilliam. No, they're not. But it is an interesting contrast to films. Thanks, George. Yeah, I'm going to say, you can pretty much put Terry any of Terry Gilliam's films up to nearly anything else and say, yeah, that's experimental. And I don't mean yeah. that in a bad way. No, he takes chances. I, th- I would say his most mainstream film, and this isn't saying much, is probably <laughs> The Fisher King, and even that's yeah. pushing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's got, uh, it's not Jeff Daniels, it's the other one. Uh, Bridges. Jeff one Bridges, Bridges, right. Bridges, yeah. Which is probably, it's one of the biggest, oh, Jonathan Price. Yeah, and Robin Williams. Mm, I was thinking Robin Williams is in that too, and yeah. Amanda Plummer. Yeah. Anyway, moving on. Mike Dans, almost shrugging it off, said, quote, I don't know, probably Buckaroo Banzai, end quote. <laughs> Apparently that movie made an impression mm. on him. Thanks, Weasel. Yes, it did. Don't say it. Derek Steele posted, quote, there will be blood, end quote. Paul Thomas As Anderson. he should know, as a, as a member of the FBI's elite killer squad. Derek Steele is a photographer. <laughs> That's Derek. just his cover. It's not a cover. <laughs> You're a cover. <laughs> All right. What? Don't, don't say it. Richard Tatum sent his, quote, Shawshank Redemption, uh, end quote. The inner, oh, uh, not, sorry. Inventor of the Tatum. No! <laughs> 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 the winner that year was Forrest Gump, which I think is painfully overrated uh, and doesn't stand up, end quote. Yes, yeah. but have you tried their shrimp? Thanks, Richard. It's actually too salty. How many kinds of shrimp are there? Oh, dear gods. Rob Butler said simply, quote, the Dark Knight, end quote. No matter how uh, good, I don't think they'll ever give the big Oscar to Batman. Thanks, Rob. No, probably not. Adam Mark had some, a uh, lot, really, of words to say. <laughs> quote, here we go, deep breath. Mm-hmm. Without question, Silence of the Lambs 1991 was the wrong choice. It tr- Hold on. It truly did have some great one-liners, and Hopkins and Foster put in amazing performances. But does anyone actually watch it anymore? See our entire episode on Silence of the Lambs. I do. Anyone? It deserved the nomination, but cannot hold a candle to, drumroll, Beauty and the Beast. The first. Ooh, there's a contrast. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> you know, it's the screaming of the uh, cutlery at night that keeps her awake. Uh, <laughs> the first full-length animated film to receive the Best Picture nomination, it is an enduring masterpiece and one of Disney's top five films ever. An amazing voice cast of the industry's best. Elaine Page, Robbie Benson... Robbie 
Benson. Yeah, I know. I know beast. he's in it, but top voice cast. Um, <sighs> yeah, see our entire episode on what was that horrible film where he played a Chicano. <laughs> Oh, we did. I don't it. even remember. It was in our whitewashing uh, series. Yeah, Go watch yeah. That. Listen to that. Oh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Angela yeah. Lansbury, Jerry Orbach, David Doggan Styers. The music, Alan Menken's Opus, is a score for the ages and a bold script and animation that allows darkness in tone and animation. The film's mm-hmm. quality and enduring memory in cinema is all the more amazing considering it was directors Gary Truesdale and Kirk Wise's future directorial debuts. Composer Menken and lyricist Howard Ashman, both previously worked on The Little Mermaid, returned to write this film's songs. Ashman, who additionally served as the film's executive producer, died of AIDS-related complications six months before the film's release, and the film is thus dedicated to his memory, to our Mm -hmm. friend Howard, who gave a mermaid her voice and a beast his soul. I could go on and on, so I will! In 1994, (laughs) Beauty and the Beast became Disney's first animated film to be adapted into a Broadway musical, which ran until 2007. Its Mm. use of digital animation for the Tale as Old as Time dance sequence was the most prominent use of this technology yet, and several of those animators went on to found Pixar. Beauty and the Beast did receive Oscar wins for Best Song, Beauty and the Beast sung by a relatively unknown French-Canadian singer named, well... You know. (laughs) Best score and best sound. It received three nominations alone just for best song. Three. With the spiteful creation of best full-length animated feature award in subsequent years, take that, Pixar, Beauty and the Beast (sighs) will likely be the only animated film to receive a best picture nomination. It was robbed, pure and simple. End quote. We actually do love it when you go wow. on and on, so thanks, Adam. Yeah. I don't know that I, I agree know. with you, but... I'm not sure. Okay. i got to think about that. That's a real... Because it's a real interesting point. Well, oh. and here's the thing. Does rewatchability factor in or not? Sure. Mm. It's a lot more fun to watch Beauty and the Beast. Does that necessarily mean it's a better picture? I don't know. I'm going to go with... tough. The, I mean... I'm going to go with the Hero Our Entire Episode on uh, yeah. Silence of the Lambs, because... Yeah. Know, but, eh, that's okay. We love hearing those opinions. We do. Speaking of those, Val Coons, celebrated scribe and director of the second best podcast in the known universe, Q Footsteps, mm-hmm. wrote, quote, This is kind of a tough question. There are a lot of movies, and a lot of really great ones haven't even been nominated. What's up, Doc? Should have won at least five, for gosh sakes. Yeah. Oh, well, oh, I didn't know either of you were serious. I mean, I love that mm-hmm. film, but best picture? Mm. I had to go to a list of nominees and winners to see who was even up for an award. Here are three that stuck out to me that I think deserved more recognition, as all three were not only excellent movies, but their social commentaries were outstanding. 1940, Stagecoach. Claire Trevor, in one of her many amazing roles, shows that social standing doesn't show who the trashy one is. Rebecca Mm. won. Great picture, too. Mm. 1974, Chinatown. It's all about money and not about people. And now we all know it. Godfather Part 2 one. There, I mean, really? Uh, uh, yeah, that is a tough year. That's, that's, yeah. Speaking of tough years, 1967, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? In the Heat of Ooh. the Night one, definitely a worthy recipient. <laughs> you think? Yeah. I can't help but feel that the whole awards thing is just a popularity contest, so I don't put much yeah. stock into any of them, end quote. Wow. Yeah, those are mm. some really, really tough years all around. Thanks, Val. Yeah. Seth Jacobs offered a big one, quote, Citizen Kane, obviously, end quote. That's one of those movies I just can't believe it didn't win Best Picture. Yeah, that, I mean, I think that had a lot more to do with politics, because Hollywood yeah, just did not didn't. like Orson Welles. No, and I'm, I'm sure William Randolph Hearst, who was putting pressure on the studios not to make the movie at all, probably didn't help. Oh, yeah, I mean, he, I'm sure, made sure none of his papers talked mm. about it. He tried to get the film out of the theaters. Yeah, he was not yep. pleased. Yeah, there was one point where I had met his grandson, William Randolph Hearst mm. III, and, well, that's time tale for another time. But thanks, mm. Seth. Nick Hoffman was last with, quote, There have been a few for me, but the first one that comes to mind is Raiders of the Lost Ark, end quote. Mm. Yeah, it did have some stiff competition with Chariots of Fire, Atlantic City, mm. On Golden Pond, and Reds. Uh. Uh, but yeah, but thanks, Nick. It's a tough year. Yeah. Mm. But, Max, this was my question, but what's yeah. your answer? I got a couple. Uh, cool. I, I got to gr- agree with uh, Richard. I think Pulp Fiction should have won over Forrest Gump. Not that Forrest Gump is a bad movie. It's just it's very sentimental and it's gimmicky. Pulp Fiction had a unique feel. Forrest Gump, It's they were like, oh, yeah, but look at all the clever photography of like inserting him in historical footage. Yeah, that was done like more than 10 years before in a Woody Allen movie called Zelig. Uh, also, 
honestly, the fact that Brokeback Mountain didn't win and that Crash did that year, that just stung. The only other one that really stands out for me is that Fargo lost to the English Patient. I didn't see the English I, Patient, but I really I like Fargo. Fargo's terrific. The English Patient, I'm sorry, I think it's dull. Oh, well, you yeah. heard it here first. English Patient, dull, max zero. No, wait. Yep. <laughs> what? I don't know. <laughs> I'm gonna keep this. You show don't make moving. any sense. Yeah. So what? <laughs> what about what about you? What, what do you think? What is your big injustice? So surprisingly, because I had to look some stuff up too. Um, Singing in the rain wasn't even nominated, oh, and that wow. year it was uh, the one uh, that won Best Picture was Greatest Show on Earth, which oh, <laughs> turns out is notorious for potentially the worst film to ever win Best Picture. It's not an awful movie, but it's very clearly it was one of those. Oh crap, Cecil B. DeMille's about to die. We gotta give him an Oscar for something. I guess, yeah. Mm. Mm. Uh, I also pulled up Brokeback Mountain, which you and I saw together. I didn't see Crash, yep. so I don't really know about that, but it was like, Ugh. yeah, they're not gonna give it to the gay movie, so never mind. No. Um, and then, hell, Star Wars lost to Annie Hall, and that oh. pissed me off when I was 13, and it pisses me off still, so. <laughs> <laughs> Grr, Annie Hall. I distinctly remember turning the Oscars off at that point really angrily because. Come on, Star Wars should win. Okay. <laughs> okay, little nerd okay, boy. Ner okay, nerd boy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but all these answers were great. We love they what you terrific. give back to us. So we're going to give you the opportunity mm. to give more. Because we're givers. Y yeah, sometimes we're carriers. Mm. Answer me this, Cape Crusaders. What actor do you think never got their due? Someone you really liked, but who never seemed mm. to get the big part, the accolades. Mm. Let us know who, and if you can, which movie, and we'll quote you on our show, offer you thanks, and shower you with bumpy bucks, the cryptocurrency with the subtle taste of pear. <laughs> Enough of that. Now, there's this. The facts. Detour. Budget. One hundred thousand dollars, potentially the cheapest film we've ever covered. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, nothing. Not not for nineteen forty five. Yeah. Even the cheaper than the room. Of course, we didn't cover the room. No, <laughs> no, we didn't, and no, we won't. <laughs> oh, that's going to be our three hundredth show. No, don't say that. Somebody will say we have to do that. No, and I know who it is. No, we're not. Anyway, take. A cool million. That's a pretty wow. nice little profit. That's not bad. Gee, ten times your budget? Sure, sign me up. Well, that explains Detour 2, the detouring, and <laughs> Detour, Detour 3, Detour Strikes Back. Yeah, um, uh, and then Detour 4, <laughs> the Detour Takes Manhattan, so sure. Yeah. <laughs> detour 5, the Detour to Hawaii. Stop it. <laughs> so, our two leads, played by Tom Neal and Ann Savage, weren't always acting it seems tom decided that it was fun to stick his tongue in her ear she slapped him pretty hard back and from then on the only times they'd speak was when they were actually acting so oh dear hey added to the performance right yay and it is kind of odd that those two didn't get along as this was actually their fourth film that they made together and um oh. turns out their last so here's a warning to all you those in ho hollywood don't stick your tongue in your co-star's ears they had god they had to tell Danny DeVito that every day. Well, not ears, because... <laughs> <laughs> no, he'd stand on a chair. Yeah, rhymes with. Anyway, speaking of acting, sometimes it's just too real. While filming the scene where Ann Savage is thumbing for a ride, a passing motorist actually stopped to try and pick her up. <laughs> Apparently the crew thought this was quite a hoot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This was not a big budget film, as was noted before. The mm. money available was so small that that really cool car belonging to Charles Haskell was actually owned by the director, Edward G. Ah, I was wondering. Other okay. ways that they pinched pennies. Ann Savage's sweater wasn't a costume. It belonged to the director's wife and had to be pinned in place. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> yeah. So... But, ah, heck, why waste talent? The close-up of Tom Neal's hands when his character is supposedly playing the piano are actually that of the film's soundtrack composer, Leo Erdodi. Boy, that guy can play piano. Yeah, um, yeah. This film is one of those films that kind of fell through the cracks. Its copyright was never properly renewed and so could be released by anyone on any format. Until Criterion came along, many versions were heavily edited and were of lesser visual quality, if you know what we mean. And... Oh. If you don't know about Criterion and the Criterion Collection, well, you're welcome. Look them up if you're a film buff. 
Seriously. Oh, though they actually do include, like, there's at least one Godzilla film in there and The Blob. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> that rather um, convenient ending where Al Roberts just happens to get picked up by random cops, yeah, mm -hmm. that was a nod to our old friend of the Hayes Code, which stated that murderers yeah, simply oh, that's do right. not get away with it. Yeah, 1945, yep, yep. boy, are we right in the middle of the Hayes Code. Oh, yeah, yep. we're up to our necks in it. Yeah, there are some scenes apparently shot in Britain because the drivers mm. are on the wrong side of the car. <laughs> well, really, this is just another bit of budget cutting as the shots they had were going in the wrong direction. So instead of refilming them, oh. the director just flipped the just negative them. and hoped no one would ever notice. <laughs> yeah. Spoiler alert, we noticed. Yeah. There was a, uh, a remake of this made in 1992. It starred oh. Tom Neal's son... Tom Neal Jr. and Leah Lavish. No idea. Uh, it was made by film historian Wade Williams. See Invaders from Mars. Wait, wait, isn't he Deadpool? No, I no, don't. That's Wade Wilson. Good, yeah, because actually, if he had, would I rather have seen his films? But uh, yeah, yeah, it went right to VHS. How odd. <laughs> huh. Yeah, I did not know that existed, but I didn't know this yeah. existed either. Nope. This film's director made a ton of B-movies in his career. Some of those include The Black Cat, starring both Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi. Oh, yes. I've heard of that. Look at Limey. Bloop, bloop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> From Ed Wood. Yeah, we yes. can't say that. Now say Boris Karloff is a <laughs> beep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The Man from Planet X, The Amazing Transparent Man, and Beyond mm. the Time Barrier. But really, lots and lots of other films. Jeez. Ugh. And there's probably a whole lot more somewhere. But uh, unless Max has some bits of info he can sprinkle over this cinematic salad like so many Bakos? I got nothing. Yeah. Well, I Not guess a word. move on to the plot. Yep. Al Roberts is a down-and-out piano player in a juke joint somewhere in New York. Sue Harvey is the club's main singer and the only sparkling light in Al's life. He wants to marry. She wants to run off to Hollywood to try and get her big break. Al tries to convince Sue that this is a dream shared by millions, realized by few, and she should stay and marry him. But she doesn't. She's off in the morning. So Al stays behind and pines until he finally makes up his mind to just talk whatever bibs and bobs he has left and hitchhike his way to be with his true love. It's a long way across country, and hitchhiking is lonely work, especially when all you have is two bits to your lousy, stinking name. Then Al's luck turns when Wheeler Dealer Charlie Haskell stops to pick up the dusty Al. At first, it's an uneasy ride. Then, Charlie starts talking. Seems he's a bookie that recently lost a big stake, but is headed all the way to L.A. to start afresh. It also seems that a recent scar was from some woman that got the best of him, some hellcat that done him wrong though it might have been Charlie that done her wrong first. Either way, he seems chummy enough. When they stop for food, he invites Al, who's broke in on his dime. Everything seems to be going well enough until it's Al's turn to drive. When it starts raining, he pulls over, trying to put up the top on the car. He's having trouble with it and with waking Charlie. Opening the door, Charlie tumbles out, hits his head on a rock, and dies. Al can't figure anyone would ever believe that he didn't kill Charlie for what turns out to be quite a wad of cash in his pocket. So he does the natural thing. He switches places with Charlie and leaves his body covered by brush on the side of the road. Sure, he's racked with guilt, but Al will get over it. In fact, the next day he's feeling pretty good, knowing he'll soon be back together with Sue. He feels so good, in fact, that he picks up a woman hitchhiker at the gas station, and she turns out to be the same woman that Charlie had dealt with before, the Hellcat. And she knows for a fact that Al ain't Charlie Haskell. Seeing an opportunity, she twists Al's arm to get him to do pretty much anything she wants or else she'll dump what she knows at the feet of the local flatfoot. At the uh, feet. Things are looking bleak for Al. Not really that rosy for Vera, but both are sure there's a rainbow at the end of that gun barrel. Or uh, something like that. Thing is, will there be for either of them? Take a watch and see. The film. So, Max, had you heard of this film before? Nope. Ah, so that would be a no. Not a, not a word. Hmm. Which, quite honestly, you know, Patton had a list of, I think, nine movies. Yeah. I believe I had heard of one. That was Pink Flamingos. I'd heard of two. I'd heard of that and La Samurai, which we covered in our Walk the Dark Street series, our entire episode mm. on La Samurai. Mm. And I figured with that, this was going to be at least a pretty interesting list. Now, that being said, mm. we're doing a little, a short 
series, and we're going to do four of them, yeah. not least of which because one of his choices was a 10-episode series. It is like, oh, uh, yeah. no. It's 10 hours long. That's Decalogue, yeah. Yeah, we, we appreciate that, Patton, but... Um, uh, it's impressive, but you know we don't want we, we want people to you know let's listen. Yeah, uh, this one's not the easiest film to find. I rented it, so it's, you, know, you can do that, mm-hmm. but it's not really streaming anywhere that I know of. Did you find it somewhere? Yeah, it was on Amazon. Oh, was it? But you had to rent. Oh no, is part was it part of no. Amazon Prime? Oh, uh, silly yeah. me, <laughs> didn't look. Thought you had to. Oops. Eh, it's fine. I don't mind. Yeah. And it's part of the Criterion Collection. Again, as I said, if you don't know about them, look them up. At the very So the reason we have DVD extras, the reason we have behind-the-scenes stuff is Criterion. Starting in 1984, as it turns out, they pioneered not only Laserdisc, but like pristine prints and all those extras that we've come now to ex- expect. This was them. Yep. And uh, You're welcome. <laughs> like we have anything to do with it. <laughs> But they championed, actually, um, they go way back to one of uh, my favorite theaters, which is the Brattle Theater in in Harvard Square, Cambridge. Mm -hmm. Uh, The people who were running that in the 50s actually started Janus Films, and Janus Films was basically brought about to bring foreign films and art films to an audience in America. And to this day, they still own, as far as I know, they own a stake in the Brattle. So if you're looking for more interesting, definitely not mainstream, foreign, art house, weird, wacky films in really nice shape. I mm. can't more highly recommend the Criterion Collection. Yeah. They've got they've got a streaming service. They've got DVDs. It, you can find them on the... Uh, there's a free library service called Canopy that has a lot of them. Yeah. Ve- definitely worth looking out for. Especially there's some films. One of my favorite films ever which is The Third Man, they did an amazing restoration on release. Oh, yeah, really that print pretty is gorgeous. Film. Oh, man, you could just eat that black and white. But <laughs> we're here to talk about Detour. Mm. Uh, do you want to start with the, the cast, which I'm, there's really not yeah. any point in going more than the first top four, because after that it's yeah. literally like some dude and some dame. But Hey, what are you doing? <laughs> ne- yeah. Next. Yeah. Um, i not heard of any of these people, have you? Not a word... I gotta say, Ann Savage has the coolest name in this movie. I love that. Ann Savage. And I gotta say, for a lot of the the noir we've seen, mm. boy, does she stand out. Holy crap. <laughs> this is this is very noir. We've got the voiceover. We've got lots and lots of light and shadow. We've got claustrophobic indoor sets. We've got hard-edged dames. Yeah, this is serious noir here. You know, but here's the thing. Pretty much every noir, it's the tough guy, and he's getting through his tough life doing tough things, and they're not very pretty, but they're tough. I'm, You know, all the big names we've seen, you know, Humphrey Bogart, etc., in the, in, and even uh, Fred McMurray when we did um, Double Indemnity, Sierra Terra episode of Double Indemnity. I'm trying to think, what would it be like if you picked Vera out of this film and put her up against any of Humphrey Bogart's characters, I honestly don't know if he would know what to do. I don't know. The thing that I liked about the character Vera is, first off, she seems like she's very young. So I think a lot of her is bluster. The thing is, the very few times Al sort of stands up to her, which is not much and not often, she doesn't quite know how to deal with it. I think she does. I think she just basically goes, yeah, I don't really care about that. And she just shrugs it off and walks away. But there's never a point where I think Al wins anything. And she no. shows up, I'm going to say about halfway through the film. This is a short film. It's literally like yeah, it's, an hour and nine yeah. minutes or something like yeah, that. Yeah, just barely. And even when she first shows up, she doesn't say anything. He just picks her up and she goes to sleep, which in a way yeah. is a really neat precursor to what her character is going to be like because she's basically like yeah i'm not afraid of you yeah and this is a woman hitchhiking alone in the 40s <laughs> mm. so i i she amazed me i was not expecting what mm. we got she was i mean that's why i called her the hellcat she's her claws are out her teeth are bared the entire time and even when she kind of like well she drinks too much and she lets a little bit of her real self show anything that that comes off as in any way threatening she is right back where she was mm. and it's really and to be fair she is a 
Hmm? It's really the chemistry between her and Al Roberts, but or uh, Tom Neal. But there's not really many other people in the film, and in fact, uh, at least one of them dies. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now she is like a ball of rage with some skin around it. She's amazing. Like I she, she's got real. She's got incredible intensity. I'm kind of surprised she didn't uh, become more famous. Well, I looked a little bit into her, and she was actually very successful in her niche. So she made mm-hmm. dozens of B movies. She never released really me get out of that range, but when she got her chance, who did she run with it? Uh, she then moved on to TV in the fifties, did a little bit of that, but she basically retired from acting and moved to Manhattan with her husband. She became mm-hmm. a speed rated pilot once taking her plane over 250 miles an hour. Oh, wow. And she was not only highly lauded as a femme fatale, but she would continue to go to noir screenings and conventions as a guest because she loved the audience and she was appreciated by them. Um, She did come back to do a little work in the 80s, including a guest appearance on, wait for it, Saved by the Bell. Oh. Yeah. But. Wow. Her last part was in 2000. Vera and Screech. No, I don't see it. (laughs) I know, right? I I don't even know what she played, but I was just like, "Uh huh? Huh? Okay. I I just assumed it was the dream sequence and she murdered all of them. Oh, boy. Now I want to see it. Yeah. Um, Her last part was in a film in 2007 called My Winnipeg, and apparently she earned her bad girl reputation all over again, and I kind of want to see that. But yeah, she was awesome. Um, Tom Neal. Tom Neal. Tom Neal. Yeah, he has this... Like, I believe he lives like his character, and we'll come back to his real life later, because there's a quote from Patton we're going to use, because this series has three judges. (laughs) He's all bluff and bluster, but he has absolutely no idea what to do with uh, Vera. Nothing. No, she just walks all over him. Because the guy is a tower of jello. You know, he doesn't have... He has no strength of character. He, He doesn't... He's just sort of drifting around. Well, he's unfortunately this makes him very believable. He's just some schlub who thinks the world's done him wrong. Yeah, and just he think he, what does he do? His girlfriend, who actually, yes, it's a pipe dream. Right, she's going. I'm going to go to be a Hollywood and be discovered. Mm-hmm. But she does something. She's actually trying to better her life, and he is just like, no, stay here, marry me, and we'll just keep. Working in this crappy club for all eternity yeah. until we die. Although, that being said, I would still go to that club if it was open today. It looks like fun. <laughs> it actually, I, I, I'm like, wait, what kind of a dive? It's This is the cleanest, best lit dive I've ever seen. Yeah, but you have to remember, even bums wore suits back then. <laughs> and I sub- apparently. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. Not to mention the fact that the piano player is really good. Well... Just don't watch his hands, because we get a little, um, he plays piano with (laughs) his slow right hand. (laughs) Thank you, hideous sun demon. Uh, I was watching, (laughs) and it's like, oh, he's not even pressing the keys down. Until we get up close, and then it's the the composer. It's someone else's hands, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but but, uh, what about his uh, personal life there? Oh, right, Tom well, Neal right. is much more famous for that. So, all right, so I was going to bring this up later, but it's fine. So... Tom Neal was on the boxing team at Northwestern University. That will come back later. Got a law degree from Harvard. It's like, oh, okay. Mm. He started acting in films in 1938, often playing toughs and bad guys. Severely assaulted another actor over another woman, which caused him to be blackballed from movie acting. In 1965, was tried and convicted Mm. for the murder of his wife. The prosecution was only able to get involuntary manslaughter, even though Neal shot his wife. In the back of the head. Yeah. They wanted the gas chamber. They only got six years. He was released and died eight months of heart failure after that. So, Mm. yeah. uh, Quite honestly, I'm guessing that what you see is what you got. Because, And in some ways, I actually really like the fact that we've got these no-name actors. In a way, it makes it more believable that they're down Mm. and out. And Beverly Hills. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) No, it's true. It's like it's not like you're looking at them going, "Oh God, how can someone who looks like Clark Gable or something be on the on the skids?" Or how can someone who looks like Lana Turner? It's like, no, nah, look at this guy. He's a part, you know, apart from the chin butt, he's completely unnoticeable. Yeah, or Margot Ro- uh, Robbie, yes, and they're complaining, yeah. "Boo hoo, I'm not Barbie pretty anymore." It's like, <laughs> um. That's nice. Yes, Helen Mirren, <laughs> as Helen Mirren says, Margot Robbie is the wrong choice to make this point. Yeah. 
And I think that it's not only do I believe both of these actors, it's their chemistry, which unfortunately is mirroring some uh, off-screen antics, yeah. that is really compelling. Uh, the other folks, we have Claudia Drake yeah, as get- Sue Harvey. She's fine. She's mm-hmm. there for five minutes and leaves. Yeah, she doesn't do much. She's but, just the, I'm going to go to Hollywood and be a star. And you, and even then you can tell, no, you're not. <laughs> yeah, you, re- you really can. No. And she apparently she goes to Hollywood and sits in a big armchair. I guess. that's all we see of her. Yeah. Edmund McDonald Jr., so he plays Charles Haskell, the guy driving mm. that really cool car. Oh, did I nice like that car. car. That was a gorgeous car. Do you know what kind it was? It was a Lincoln, and apparently there were oh, only okay. 400 of it made. It was it belonged oh, to the director. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. Um, Charles Haskell is not on screen for long, but I actually got a real feeling of depth from him. As soon as he starts talking, I'm like, oh, God, this guy's trouble. This this guy's an operator. You can tell. Yeah, he, you. Wa- I wanted to know more about him. I'm mean, is that really his father? Was he really rich? Did he actually get that scar from playing with Prussia, Prussian swords? Well, and to be fair, that was a thing. Believe it or not, I found that out from the autobiography of Norman Rockwell. Uh, oh. Yeah, he actually met... He was, stabbed some kid in the eye, too? No, but he was witness to the German kids who were doing this. This was oh. a like rite of passage back in, like I think, the, it was at the 30s or 20s or 30s, or it might have been after the war, I can't remember. Hmm. But they would literally get into these boots that were bolted to the ground and stand there while their friend would swing a sword, hoping to get a good but not really debilitating scar. Oh, the dueling scar. Yeah. Okay. Haskell, he seems very sure of himself and what he's doing, and you get the impression there's a lot behind him, like potential mob connections? I don't know, mm. but... And he's also always taking these pills, which we don't know what they're for. Yeah. And here's a question I have for you, because this is a, a weird part of the film. Do you think he died before he fell out of the car or not? I don't know. I don't think we're supposed to know. I think he was already dead. I do, too. I really do. But, because it's the way he falls, it's like, that wouldn't kill him. It would hurt, but it wouldn't kill him. It might give him a concussion. I mean, he whacks his head on a rock, but he's not doesn't fall at any kind of velocity. No. And he doesn't hit the back of his head. No. Nope. So, yeah, I, I think he was already dead. Well, and here's the cool thing. It doesn't matter. And, and Yeah, it really doesn't. And, it's and, all Because then it's all what goes on in Al's head. And I was like, no, no one's ever going to believe me that I did, that I didn't kill him. Yeah. And he's right. <laughs> no one yeah, is. he's right. So he does what anyone would do in that situation. He shoves the body under a bush, takes his clothes and his money and his, his wallet, and drives off. Yeah. I, I don't know what he would have done either. So those Why are, he picks up a hitchhiker, I don't know. I mean, there's some questions in this film. Yeah. That's one of them. Because he had actually even heard from... Haskell that yeah I picked up this dame and we had trouble and it's like you get the impression from Haskell that the trouble probably started with him it seems more likely I assume he was yeah you know, he says you know you you treated Rod Rice you expect her to be nice to you right yeah which it's is, like yeah let me guess yeah. yeah yeah no and Haskell there's something sleazy about everything about him yeah I kept what I was disappointed when I found that his name was Charles I really wanted it to be Eddie. <laughs> Yeah, except as we all know, Eddie oh. Haskell became a cop. So, uh, hello, Mrs. Cleaver. Hi, Mrs. Cleaver. It's nice to see you today. No, he didn't. Well, <laughs> he was not uh, Ren from Ren and Stimpy. Would've... No. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it's a small cast. They're nobodies, and I think that mm-hmm. actually works as a strength in this film, which was surprising. Yeah. But um, we open the credits, which are pre-movie credits, because it's basically, hey, who we have to thank for bringing this film back to, up to snuff, so to speak? And ah, George Lucas! Oh, whew, what? Oh, he just helped pay for the restoration. Whew, that was ah. close. I was worried it was going to be Lucas White. Yeah. Who, who the hell is PRC Pictures? Yeah, so this was part of something I didn't know. They were actually one of the studios, what was called Poverty Row, uh, which was basically oh, the studios okay. that put out its producer something corporation. I don't remember. And apparently the director was like their top guy. He apparently did quite well mm-hmm. by them. And uh, they just they put out um, low budget independent films, you know, B movies technically. Oh, okay. And for those who okay. don't know, a B movie was literally you used to get to see more than one film. When you bought a ticket, you might be oh, there all boy. afternoon you, and you would you see You got yep. you would see the news A reels. Yeah. You get news reels, you get cartoons, maybe a short you subject. You get B feature, you get a lesser movie and you get the feature. Yeah. 
and this is the the B film. This is the set. It's like mm-hmm. literally like a B side of a single. It, okay, probably, a single was a record writes. that had one side. <laughs> oh, I know. Right? I know. Uh, and a record is a piece of <laughs> vinyl. <laughs> vinyl poly, polyvinyl chloride is yeah. Okay, whatever. Yeah. So yeah, this these were low budget films that were hoping to make their money because people would pay to see the big film. Mm-hmm. And in some cases, some B films did very well, and this company put out tons of them. It's sort of sort of like if we put out enough films, some of them have to make money. It's yeah, yeah. <laughs> Throw enough of them at the wall, one of them's going to stick. Yeah, and I want to say like I, I did not look this up, but this has to have been one of the most successful independent films up till Love at First Bite. See our entire episode of <laughs> <laughs> Love. At I First wouldn't be Bite. surprised. Yeah. Because, yeah, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's good. I will say, though, the the print was gorgeous. Print was beautiful. I was really surprised. Yeah. I gotta say, too, there's some really interesting direction in this film. Mm. We start off in this little cafe somewhere, it doesn't matter where, and there's this shot where his coffee cup, Al's coffee cup, is way up close to the camera, and he reaches, he's very foreshortened. And if I'm looking at the cup, I actually think they may have made a larger-than-life cup to really like magnify that distance Mm -hmm. but it's a really neat shot and you don't see it often at all never mind in a b movie it's there is some really interesting camera work in this Mm. i liked it It, like one of the last scenes when spoiler vera is dead (gasps) and he's in shock Mm -hmm. and and al is just looking around the room and everything goes out of focus and he'll just suddenly uh, it'll f- the, it'll clear up for individual objects, mm. and it's obviously he's attempting to convey the the way you look at things when you're in shock. However, the world doesn't seem real, and you focus on really tiny, unimportant details. I I have to say I'm not sure it worked for me. It was because mo- when you do that, go blurry and then focus in. Honestly, it just gives me a headache. <laughs> I but I like it's it. a I I thought it was a real. I thought that was a really good experiment. I thought that was bold. Well, and you don't even have to be in shock. That's literally how your eye works. The the number mm. of um, um, ions, that's what they're called, don't look <laughs> it up, that actually you can focus on anything. Look it up! <laughs> don't! Is very, very small. Like, uh, if you're looking at an object, almost everything around that object is actually out of focus. Oh, you okay, just can't so, okay. tell because if you your go to look at it, it in. suddenly yeah. you can focus on it. Yeah, you yeah. can't focus on the things in your periphery. It doesn't work that way. Hmm. There's all, but there's some other stuff he does in the diner. When he's, he obviously isn't speaking out loud. He's thinking. He's narrating, if you will. Yeah. And when he goes to the past, the lighting shifts. And suddenly it's dark except for a light that's just on his eyes. And it lets you know that we're now in his head, and the rest of what's around him doesn't matter. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta give him credit for not doing the. <laughs> it was a really I interesting rem- change from that. The little, yeah. I don't know what the hell they use, Vaseline or whatever. Something, yeah. Um, but there's some other stuff he does too. With that, there's a point where he's um, looking in the rearview mirror while he's driving, and we're looking. That's the only thing we can really see. The rest is really just dark. And then there's a point where he's thinking about Sue, and she's singing in this club somewhere. And there's these great silhouettes of the band members behind her, kind of like um, Fantasia. It almost looks like a cartoon. Yeah, it I was, was good thinking of that. Well, and it was neat because in a way, it really exemplifies how you dream. You really mm-hmm. picture in detail the important parts, and then the rest of it's just kind of you know like background. It might have been a cost-saving feature. Hey, we don't have to have a set, but it. I don't know. I thought it really stood out, especially among basically B films, you know, places you mm. don't expect to see any kind of experimentation. And I, I was really interested in that. What did you think of the dialogue or the writing? In general, I actually thought it was right there, right smack dab in the middle of noir. Mm. It was... Mm. You even had the terrible, I mean, sorry, the uh, dramatic <laughs> metaphors, you know, the, 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 sorry, the similes, you know, the drops streak down the windshield like tears. Yeah. Like wow! I just feel, I can feel the bourbon in my glass now, and suddenly I think I have a five o'clock shadow under my beard. Yeah, and you know, so there was another one that was about uh, Al was talking about money. Is like money, you know what that is—the stuff you never have enough of. Little green things, with George Washington's picture that men slave for, commit crimes for, die for. It's the stuff that has caused more trouble in the world than anything else we ever invented, simply because there's too little of it. I mean, yeah. I would put the writing up in this with pretty much all of the other noir we saw in Walk the, the Dark Street. 
I don't know. I, I think this is a little more, a little bit more ham-handed. It's still, it's very noir, but a lot of the other ones had more poetry in them. This, I think, is a little more blunt instrument. I mean, Vera, people knock themselves out trying to buck fate. Yeah, try saying that five times fast and not get in trouble. <laughs> uh, I can't say it at all, actually, but uh, that's because my name's not Vera. Luckily, yeah. Max's name is Vera. It is. It's true. It says so right on his birth certificate, right next to Mister. Um, yep. The Max thing for me is that that's... Vera Levine. Yep. <laughs> hey, Vera. <laughs> the one that's one of the things that makes noir noir is sometimes, especially period noir, because, of course, Le Samurai came later, and we both agreed that Le Samurai is very noir, even though it's French and in the mm. 60s. And it's that dialogue, that Dashiell Hammett, you know? And I, in a way, I think it works better here in some cases because it's not as fluid and poetic. Of course it's not written as well. This is on the cheap, just like the characters mm. in the noir are. So the writing wasn't what stood out to me. What stood out to me is like, why are they in Britain? Um, why aren't his <laughs> hands actually touching the piano keys? Um, uh, um, yeah. And it's, you know, there's a sequence where he's talking allegedly to Sue on the phone. Yeah. And I was like, he doesn't let her say anything. It's like, hi, honey. Oh, really? Oh, you're working there? <laughs> oh, what? It's, like, it's like, wow, she must talk fast. Yeah. And, um, the entirety of L.A. is represented by one used car lot. That's it. That's all of mm. Los Angeles. Cause, you know, oh, of and that. a flop house. Or not a flop well, house. It's actually a fairly nice hotel. But that's interior. That's not. That could be anywhere. True. So the only it's true. We don't see. Of LA, there's no outside. Yeah, it's a used car lot. That being said, mm -hmm. most of the film is shot either in that apartment or in mm. front of a rear projection screen. <laughs> and it's, yep. it's obvious. Yeah, I mean, at least they're obvious. not like you know, literally jumping up and down in their seats to make it look like they're moving. <laughs> I think they actually did have a and stage hand, you know, moving the, the, mm. the body of the car. And I want that mm. car. I so want that car. That car gets uh. a mile to the gallon or a gallon to the mile, whatever. But I so want that car. It's so cool. <laughs> and it's, and, and there's p points. It's like, it's very cheap. You, you like, yeah. you're waiting for the backdrop to fall over. Stuff like that. <laughs> it is very, very cheap. And yes, and, there's, they, uh, they couldn't even really afford a lot of extras. Every place they go, there's like one or two people. <laughs> and you just know that there's like one of them's probably running the camera and he had to run yeah. around and get in front of it. And then, hey, hey, get the, get the best boy over there here. Just sit at the corner and pretend to blink, drink coffee. We really need four people in the shot. I can't. I'm holding up the lights. <laughs> and and uh, there's kind of a charm about that. Yeah. And sometimes, and we've talked about this in the show, sometimes there can be stuff like this and you're just like, I'm brought out of the film. I can't take this serious. And sometimes mm -hmm. it works. We'll see if it works yeah. this time or not. But it was very noticeable. Um, you know, I didn't scream out, on the left, on the left, dickweed! <laughs> but I wanted to. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I do have to question, like you did, why would Al pick up a, a woman? But I also have to question, so we have two death scenes in here, both of mm -hmm. which are attributed to Al. Spoiler! We do tell you at the beginning of the show. One of them is when Haskell falls out of the car. I'm okay with that because we see him taking pills, and both Max and I think yeah. he died. Um, but then there's this scene in the hotel. Oh, dear. Vera's had a little too much to drink, and <laughs> she gets away from... Al to go call the cops finally and say drags the phone drags into the, room the phone with her. To the bedroom collapses on the bed. Somehow the cord is draped across her neck, <laughs> and Al is yeah. then tugging the phone cord through the locked door to try and pull the phone away for her, break the phone, and can't seem to do it. And somehow strangles her. <laughs> Yeah. I was like, why don't you pull the other end out of the wall? They're, these things were not made with steel cable. No. Um, how'd you feel about that strangulation scene? I I, I mean, I liked the idea. Yeah. Like, oh God, you know, this poor schlub, he is in effect, he may or may not have accidentally killed two people. He didn't mean to. And it's it's a very big thing about, yeah, the sometimes everything just goes against you. But come on! I mean... The strangling, first off, with a phone cord, that's hard anyway. Those things were not very durable. We see that in the movie sometimes, all right. But she had, like, her ar her arm up by her head. It would have been no effort for her to just stick her arm between the cord and her head. Yeah. I. It was... 
I just literally physically, and by physically I mean physics, couldn't position things in any way that that would actually have worked. And the weird thing is, is they actually set something up that would also have made sense. And it would oh, the still window? Be, no, no. The, so oh. she, at various points, is coughing. And at one right. point, and he the makes... the suggestion is she may have consumption. Well, he brings up Camille, right, right who died by the same yeah. thing. Why could she have not got into the room, was going to call the cops, started a coughing fit, choked and died he breaks or in. even fallen and hit her head well i wouldn't have done that because we already did that i actually would have been great if there happened to be a rock in the room <laughs> <laughs> like this rock that leaps was, up and hits her <laughs> no that, that was big decor in the 40s she could have been choking mm. and she could have yeah. died he breaks into the room goes to like strangle her it's like you're not calling the cops she finds out she's dead realizes no one's going to believe that either yeah. yes it's coincidental but it's a little bit more believable than oh no the foreign phone cord somehow was able no i don't yeah, yeah I don't. that was a bit much yeah i also just didn't know exactly what her angle was we don't really know what is it vera wants yes money but like where is she coming from i like you i wish we knew a little bit more about her especially yeah she's interesting but we, we don't really know anything about her motivation or her backstory you don't necessarily need the backstory but that whole plan she comes up with where when it turns out uh haskell's dad is a is is rich and is dying and she wants him to go and impersonate haskell and at first, he can't even explain to her how stupid that is, and yeah. he finally gets around to it. It's like, I, I don't, as he says, I don't know what his middle name is. I don't know what is, if he has an Aunt Edna. It's a dumb plan, but she's absolutely fixated on it. Yeah, well, because it's like $4 million, which in 1945 mm. is um, a, it was a lot. Yeah. That was all the money, I, yeah. I'm really glad the film didn't continue for another half an hour with them going yeah. through that, because... I was afraid that was going to happen, except I was looking at the time going, wait, how are they going to do this in 15 minutes? If even that, like 10. <laughs> if, yeah, 10 maybe. It's yeah. Yeah, right at the end. So, yeah, um, there's there's a number of, um, shall we say, lesser aspects of this film. But does that mean it doesn't work? Because they're pretty big aspects. Uh, have you got any more notes you want to get to before we and Patton mm -hmm. decide? Mm-hmm. I do want to point out that I was, I have it in my notes that uh, Al picks Vera up in Needles, Needles, California, and I was wondering, did she does she know Snoopy's brother Spike? Because <laughs> he lives in Needles. Hey, Needles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah sorry, that's a little back. Uh, in the also, future. in the scene where they go to the drive-in, I was very disappointed that the waitresses were not on roller skates. Yeah, uh, I, but as I actually... I know, I, that, that, that was a thing for the 50s, I think. I don't know if they did that in the 40s. Well, I just thought it was cool because they're doing it unironically. Like, that's something people yep. just did. And quite honestly, they sure. probably just drove up and shot the scene and didn't tell anybody. Yeah, very likely. Because, <laughs> yeah, this is there's a lot of... Um, Ed Wood School of Filmmaking here, because, I mean, we don't quite have cardboard tombstones, but the... There wasn't a big rubber octopus, But no. the quick run, uh, we don't have a permit, was in the back of my mind when watching this yeah. film. So, anything else? That was something... Oh. You know, one thing really struck me, just as an event, and it, not so much the movie, but the history. When, they, when he gets to California, he's stopped by the highway patrol mm. and quizzed as, what are you doing in California? Yeah. What what do you have in the trunk? That's still yeah. a thing. Really? Yep. I did not know that. I guess I've never driven over the California border. Yep, I did it once. I drove from Tucson to uh, Anaheim. And huh. one of the things is especially is fruit because there are apparently oh, parasites oh. or insects right. that they're trying to keep out of the California growers area. And so okay. they're like, you can't bring fruit in and out of the state. So, yeah, this, I mean, to be huh. fair, this happened to me in like 1990. But yeah, that was a thing. And it's really weird because it's like, know that. oh, here's a border stop in the middle of nowhere. There's nothing. Yeah. And oh. like, what are you going to do if I just turn around and leave? Nothing. <laughs> but they won't let you stop through. or I'll say stop again. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but I think. Yeah, that's all I had. I think it's time to get to that part to see who yeah. agrees with whom, if anyone. The finish. So, Max. But. <laughs> line. <laughs> Kristen Honey, we're filming. Um, oh, oh. Yeah. Uh, you'd never heard of this. I'd never heard of this. You nope. watched it last nope, night, I'm nope, guessing? Nope, nope. Yep. 
First time ever. What'd you think? I thought it was really interesting. I don't. Th- I can't say I enjoyed it because it's one of those movies. It's a type of movie I don't like where you're just waiting for everything to explode. Mm-hmm. And you could see that. Also, while I do think Ant Savage is terrific, I thought Tom Neal was eh. You know, he was okay. Okay. She was terrific. The, what gets me is, how have I never heard of this movie? And it is absolutely, it's a distilled noir. Yep. It's like, the only th- difference is we only see them drink in one scene. <laughs> that's true. That's that's it. You know, usually everybody's, you know, drinking constantly in noir. But at least they smoke a lot. I mean, even still, not all that much. You know why they probably true. couldn't afford the cigarettes. <laughs> that's another thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't yeah. smoke. I need that quarter. Okay. Uh, I thought it was really interesting. As you said, it's a really interesting example of trying to make noir and try and pretty much pulling it off. I think on a nickel and dime budget. Mm. What about you? What do you think? I think I liked it better than you did. I mm. this is a film that I'm going to excuse its flaws and say. It comes down to Anne Savage and Tom Neal, and I did like Tom Neal mostly because he wasn't that stronger character. Oh. He comes off as that tough loner, but it's quite obvious he's not. If he didn't run into to Anne, um, Anne Savage's character Vera, something else would have happened. He was not going to make it to L.A. unscathed. Something, mm. or if Charlie hadn't died, something was going to happen, and he was not going to be able to find his way out. This is not the character. This is not the Humphrey Bogart character. This, this is guy a, is not hard boiled. He's soft boiled. He's, he's moist. over easy, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> he's soft and moist, yes. But he's also the kind of guy that these things likely happen to. And in yeah. that way, I found him totally believable. I also found it believable that given one more push, that boxer was going to come out again and Vera <laughs> was really going to regret it. Yeah. There are some, I mean, the glaring errors are glaring when they're getting in on the wrong side of the car and stuff. You're literally yeah. just like, what is with that? And the, you know, the, the rear projection scenes, it's like usually in those films, they would keep those to a minimum because they kind of knew no one actually believed them. Yeah. But here they do it a lot, but they I, do. I didn't care. This was a tight little film. That part didn't bother me. And like me. you said, it's distilled noir. It is as noir as it gets. Mm. It's down and out. It's the, the dialogue. It's the people. Yeah. Again, Vera's character, we don't see that really at all, especially in the 40s. And I did not know it was coming, and I was just as shocked as he was. Like, oh, oh, oh yes, ma'am, yes. I go, but what do I do? To- I let her in the car. Maybe she'll just get out on her own. Oh, crap, she didn't. Um, um. It's 69 minutes long. It's That's all there is. And it doesn't waste a moment. And I no. like the the filmic experimentation of the director. I think he throws in some really nice little tidbits there. So mm. yeah, but we're only two but of Pat three judges. Think. Yeah, we're yeah. only two of three judges. So he's, As he's we always ask ourselves, what would Patton do? <laughs> well, only for these four films, but yes. Well, yes. So his quote was, "Quote: Look, if I had my way, I'd be just be grabbing every '40s film noir they had here in the closet, but this." It's 69 minutes long. It is the darkest, bleakest film noir. This, if you want to learn how to do efficiency and storytelling and characterization, Tom Neal, who was perfectly cast because basically his life was paralleling the life of the doomed protagonist in this film, basically, <laughs> he's kind of coming apart. It's method acting without it being method acting. And then Anne Savage's Vera may be one of the scariest film noir femme fatales. She's not even a femme fatale. She's a femme flat out death. End quote. <laughs> so, um, I, I I think Patton liked the movie. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, but uh, one other thing that Patton really likes is when you answer our poll question. Patton really enjoys this. He told me that over our magic space phone. Yeah, magic space phone. Guess where that's going to yep. find itself in about ten seconds. But what we'd like to know next <laughs> week. <laughs> That it hurt. Yes. What we'd like to know next week is what actor do you think never got their due? Someone you really liked, but who never seemed to get the big parts, the accolades. Let us know who, and if possible, the movie. And you can do that by emailing us directly at us at maxmikemovies.com. We can go to our website, maxmikemovies.com, where many people well, at least two, have left comments or ideas for series or films that they think we should watch, or heck, sometimes even talk to each other, which is awesome. 
You can also go to our one and only social media site on Facebook, which is Max Mike Movies. Leave comments there, suggestions, etc. Last of all, if there is a podcast app out there, oh yes, we're there, whether we want to or not. Of course we want to, although we're still apparently not on YouTube somehow, because um, that mm-hmm. thing hasn't imploded or whatever. But again, find us at Max Mike Movies. But Indeed. because Patton says so just started, we have the first of the of our four films. Max, what's the second of our four films going to be? Well, I think this is a bit of a change of pace. For this is more of a, I'm not sure if it's a comedy. It's supposed to be a little more heartwarming. Oh, and also it stars a lot of foreign people. Uh-oh. If you know what I mean. Well, that can't be. And that. I've heard a rumor about this movie. I've never seen it, but I hear these foreigners don't even speak English in it. <gasps> what? Yeah, I know, I know. I'm worried too. But we're still going to check out the flavor of green tea over rice, which I assume tastes like wet rice. (laughs) Well, hopefully our show next week won't sound like wet rice. (laughs) Plop, uh, um, Plop, um, drip, drip, I guess. (laughs) So do plop, plop, drip, drip with us next week, won't you? What a relief it is. This has been a co-production of The Voice of Max and The Movie Wrench.